हेलो एवरीबॉडी वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू वेदांत जी इंग्लिश चैनल दिस इज मी योर मास्टर टीचर नवोमिता भट्टाचार्य एंड टुडे वी आर हियर टू डिस्कस द होल चैप्टर ऑफ सॉल्यूशंस बेसिकली वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट इट एंड एंड इट टुडे एज वेल सो लेट्स गो अहेड एंड लेट्स क्विकली सॉल्व इट या लेट्स लेट्स कंप्लीट द होल चैप्टर विदाउट मच फर्दर अडू यस सो सॉल्यूशंस इट इज अ चैप्टर फ्रॉम योर क्लास 12th NCERT बुक एंड इट इज इट इज अ अ Uh, also there in your uh, J syllabus, yes. So let's uh, complete it now. Let's take a look at what exactly is going to uh, come in this chapter, right? And how many questions can you expect? So uh, this chapter basically has uh, topics like topics like as you can see, expressing concentration of solution, which you have done a little bit in the mole concept and stoichiometry chapter, right? After that comes solubility. From where we have seen one or two questions have come in the past, right? And vapor pressure of uh, liquid solution has has uh, seen a uh, three to four questions, yeah, in all the uh, in all the sets and uh, about in three three years of uh, pattern. If you see, then you must have seen three to four uh, papers. Now the one concept from where most of the questions do come is colligative properties and determination of molar mass. Yes, so in in about uh, six to eleven questions have come in the past from these uh, topic, which is basically almost the end part of the chapter. We we will cover it today as well. Abnormal molar masses also has seen around two to eighteen questions. Yes, so basically, uh, if you can see, then uh, these are the topics that are most important from this chapter. So. Let's begin. But without, without, without <laughs> wasting any more time, let me also tell you that please don't forget to subscribe to this channel because you know that this channel deals with J E M Z B I T E V I T R I P L E everything and anything. So please do follow it. This channel is dealing with everything absolutely in English. Okay. So subscribe to the channel and I'll keep seeing you. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Chalo. Moving on. Now let's start with solution. What exactly is a solution? Of course, we have read about it, and of course, we know a little bit about solution. But what is the definition? What is the definition? Actually, solutions are. Let's write it here, okay? Solutions are homogeneous. What? Mixtures? Yes. Solutions are homogeneous mixtures. All right? Yes. Homogeneous mixtures. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Of what? How many components? Yes. Homogeneous mixtures of two or more components. All right. Of two or more components. Yeah. Does that make sense, everybody? Of course. In a solution, we must have seen right sugar and water. What is it? Two components. It can be a little more than that also. Sugar, salt, water, and 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 uh, lemon juice. Lemonade. Let's make some lemonade in the summer, right? So, how many components does that have? They have, that has more than two components, isn't it? Yeah. So, basically, solutions are homogeneous mixtures of two or more components. Now, what is homogeneous, bacha log? What is homogeneous, bachus? Homogeneous basically means something that has uniformity. Yes. Homogeneous means something that has uniformity. Yes. Homogeneous means. uniformity that means a solution has uniformity in it similarity the sip as you sip a lemonade the taste does not keep changing right it's not like eat too sweet eat too sour eat too salty that doesn't happen it's uniform throughout the glass you will find the same taste isn't it yes now what we know is now what we know about a solution is that solvent is usually the Is the component that is present in larger quantity, right? Generally, generally, you know that a solution has two components: solute and solvent. Now we know that it is generally the solvent, right? So let me write that down here. Generally, solvent is present in larger quantity. Okay, 
and solute is component that is present in smaller quantity okay yes solute is present in is present in smaller quantity hey guys don't get confused what is solute solute is the sugar the salt that you add into water now obviously you don't add sugar equal to the glass of water right the all the sugar always added is about one spoon or one tablespoon some, something like that sort of so isn't it common sense that solute is present in smaller quantity solvent is present in larger quantity makes sense right also one more thing that you have to know is that it is the solvent that decides the physical state of solution what did i say it is the solvent solvent decides the solvent decides the physical state of solution okay physical state of solution okay so these are the few things that we can remember about solution but it's okay nobody is going to ask you this in the examination all right yes the examination part i'll definitely tell you don't worry about it now let's take a look at types of solution did you always think that solution basically means what liquid in water i mean liquid in uh, sorry 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 salt in liquid water in, uh, sugar in liquid oh my god sorry yeah did you always think that solution is always like a solid in a liquid no there are different types of solution there is gaseous solution where you see the solvent is always gas 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 why because solvent decides the physical state remember yes now gas in gas example is mixture of oxygen and nitrogen gases right liquid in gas example is chloroform mixed with nitrogen gas solid in gas camphor in nitrogen gas yeah these are the examples same like that gas in liquid what do you have oxygen dissolved in water liquid in liquid ethanol dissolved in water solid in liquid glucose dissolved in water sugar dissolved in water salt dissolved in water right now we come to solid solution gas in solid solution of hydrogen in palladium okay liquid in solid amalgamation of mercury with sodium solid in solid is copper dissolved in gold okay so these are the examples of different types of solution right okay now we come to the topic where expressing concentration of solution but by the way why are we expressing concentration of solution any idea why are we doing that yeah i said tell me something tell me something let's say that i have a i have a container here okay let's say that i have a container here in this i have some water i have another container like this here same like this i have some water here as well now in this i have put one spoon of salt here i have put 30 spoon of salt now you will say that ma'am both of them are salt solution okay both of them are salt solution agreed great which one will be more salty obviously the b b1 the b container will be more salty right yeah yes now i can also say as per whatever we have learned from the uh, you know the junior classes right in 9th standard 10th standard we have learned about these two terms called dilute and concentrated do you remember yeah dilute and concentrate co concentrated isn't it so i will probably call this one to be dilute because the saltiness will be a little less and this one probably i will be calling it as concentrated because the saltiness will be more this is dilute this is concentrated right yeah but hey guys this is chemistry this is science just a vague term of dilute and concentration is not going to help us we need things that can make us calculate things that can make us measure everything isn't it so that means there was a time a time has come now that we want to have more concentration of solution we want to have more terms we want to make our life harder basically that's what we mean right yeah that's what we mean agreed agreed dilute and concentration was very easy two ways so we wanted to make our life a little harder so we have discovered and we have introduced some more new terms here okay all right so 
basically what we are saying is that composition of a solution that can be can be described by expressing its concentration you cannot always say that ah, 30 spoon of sugar 30 spoon of ethanol 30 spoon of chloroform no a spoon is not what we generally use in chemistry isn't it so yeah so what are we going to do here what are we going to do let's write it down that composition of what did I say? Composition of a solution can be described by expressing its concentration. So, composition, composition of a, of a solution, okay, composition of a solution can be described, can be described by Yes, can be described by expressing its concentration. All right. Yes. Okay. Now, there are seven terms that we are going to learn. Okay. There are seven terms that we are going to learn. Can somebody tell me what are the seven terms here? What are the seven terms? The number one is mass percentage. Yes, number one is mass percentage. Yes, number two is mass by volume percentage. Yes, mass by volume percentage. All right, number three is what? Can you guess? Volume by volume percentage or volume percentage. Yes, number three here is volume percentage. Coolio. Number four, any idea what can it be? Number four is uh, parts per million. Yeah. parts per million. Number 5, I am writing it here. Let us say that it is molarity. Number 6 is molality. <laughs> Number 7 is, is, is a strength. And then there is of course another one that is uh, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 is a uh, mole fraction. Yes, mole fraction we forgot. All right. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. So, I said that there are seven terms, but we are also adding on to strength. We will be adding strength here. Okay. Strength is not given in your book, but I will however tell you because there have been questions related to strength as well. So, Chalo, let's start them one by one. Yes. Okay. Let's understand mass percentage. What is the definition? The definition of mass percentage is amount of solute in grams present in 100 gram of solution. What is it? Amount of solute okay amount of solute yes amount of solute in grams in grams present present in 100 gram solution okay present in 100 gram of solution cool yes so, how do we write it? We write it as obviously the formula is mass percentage, right? What is the formula here? The formula is mass percentage mass percentage is equal to amount of solute, right? So, mass of solute mass of solute divided by divided by what total mass of solution mass of solution multiplied with 100 okay that's your mass percentage moving on let's understand what is mass by volume percentage what is mass by volume percentage amount of solute in grams present in dissolved in 100 ml of solution yes so, amount of, 
amount of solute in grams dissolved in dissolved in 100 ml solution yes getting it everybody this is easy i mean you have done it in mole concept and stoichiometry in class 11 so this is basically like a quick revision so that is why i'm not explaining too much also i have taken a topic wise lecture in which i explain so please watch it if you want yeah so let's take a look at it what is this um, this is mass by volume percentage right mass by volume percentage yes so how do we write it we write it as mass of solute mass of solute divided by volume of solution multiplied with 100 correct yes that is the correct answer right total volume of solution this is in milliliter okay this is in milliliter all right guys moving on to let's understand volume percentage what is volume percentage volume by volume though that is volume of solute in milliliter dissolved in 100 ml of solution right what is it volume of solute in milliliter dissolved in 100 ml solution correct everybody yes so that means how do we write it how do we write it we will write it as volume of solute divided by volume of solution multiplied with 100 correct this is also easy peasy biryani tasty there is no doubt here i hope right okay moving on now let's understand parts per million what is parts per million very simple very easy pretty much like the mass percentage however instead of multiplying it with 100 this time we will be multiplying it with a million so what is it this is basically this is written as ppm parts per million how do we write it we write it as number of parts of solute present in number of parts of solute present in yes present in million that is 10 to the power 6 yes present in million parts of solution million parts of solution all right yes so that means how do we write it how what is the formula the formula is a number of parts of solute divided by yes divided by divided by total number of parts of all components in solution divided by total number of parts of all components in solution multiplied with 10 to the power 6 okay that's your formula got it yes now this part let's let's just do it a little faster because the but the second half of the chapter is the one that is more important what is mole fraction everybody you all know it you all know it we have done mole fraction we have done molarity we have done molality all of it in mole concept and stoichiometry if you haven't watched it you want to just recap your class 11 just go and watch the mole concept video that is there in the channel all right there is a whole playlist that is created please do check it out please do check it out don't miss it very important for your jee okay now, what is mole fraction guys? The ratio of number of moles of one component to the total number of moles of all the components. What did I say? Ratio of. What do you mean by ratio? Ratio means you have to divide. Okay. Ratio means you have to divide. So, ratio of number of moles. Yes. Of one component. 
of one component yes of one component to the total number of to the total number of moles of all the components total number of moles of all the components yes so let's say that in a in a in a solution i have two components that is a and b what are a and b components a and b are let's say components of a solution yes so how do i write how do i write how am i going to write it i'm going to denote it as also this is denoted by chi okay this is not x this is chi so chi of a is equal to is equal to n a that is moles of component a divided by n a plus n b okay that's how you write mole fraction now let's go to molarity what is molarity number of moles of solute dissolved in 1 liter of solution what is it number of moles of solute dissolved in 1 liter of solution yes dissolved in 1 liter of solution all right so that means how do we write the formula how do we write the formula very easy very simple moles of solute divided by 1 liter of solution that is what volume of solution in liter okay volume of solution in liter cool yes molarity is given by capital m guys okay molarity is given by capital m okay now we understand molality molarity no molality just like imagine that you have a speech problem like sometimes i do have yeah sometimes i do have a speech problem yeah so anyway molality what is molality number of moles of solute per kg of the solvent okay number of moles of solute per kg of solvent yes per kg of solvent that is how do we denote that we can denote that as this is denoted with small m so moles of solute this is not looking good let me write that again hmm moles of solute divided by what do we write here what do we write mass of solvent in kg absolutely right very good yes how do we write it mass of solvent in kg right so we are almost done with everything now let's understand strength what is strength acha all of this for all of this formulas that we have written now i'm going to tell you one trick here and then we will do a solve we will we will do a problem okay what is strength guys strength is basically mass of solute in grams yes mass of solute in grams divided by divided by volume of solution in liter all right yes that is your strength now can i tell you a trick here yes volume of solution in liter wherever you see the volume term in denominator yes this is a volume term in denominator that means that this is going to be temperature dependent okay this is going to be temperature dependent why because volume is temperature dependent isn't it yes what happens you increase the temperature the volume also increases because what happens the state starts to change from liquid to solid so this is temperature dependent is this temperature dependent no this is not temperature dependent okay so i'm writing it down here not temperature dependent all right yes not temperature dependent now 
what about molarity what about molarity what do you see volume of a solution volume of a solution here that means that this is going to be temperature dependent correct oh yes this is temperature dependent what about mole fraction na na not at all we're talking about moles here yes now what about this total number of parts of all component in solution is this temperature dependent no but is this volume percentage absolutely yes this is also temperature dependent okay this is temperature dependent now what about mass by volume percentage this is also temperature dependent because volume of solution yes <laughs> you getting my point right this is also temperature dependent everybody now if you check it out total mass percentage is this temperature dependent no guys all right yes so you have understood which one is temperature dependent and which one is not temperature dependent now shall we do a question what do you all say let's do a question here everybody the molality of urea solution in which 0.0100 gram of urea nh22co is added to 0.3000 dm cube of water at stp is how do we do this how do we do this all we have to do is let's check it out here yes moles of solute divided by moles of solute divided by what will we do mass of solvent in kg yes mass of solvent in kg okay all right so how do we do it how do we do it moles of solute is it given to you is it given to you no what is given to you is mass in grams is given to you so how, let's calculate the moles of solute okay let's calculate the moles of solute how do we calculate moles of solute is equal to yes given mass divided by molar mass okay given mass divided by molar mass mm that means that 0.0100 0.01 isn't it 0.01 is given to you now what is the molar mass of urea and molar mass of urea is actually 60 if you want you can remember it otherwise you can calculate it also okay 60 so 0.01 divided by 60 will be how much calculate it later let's first calculate this okay this is your m molality we are calculating so m is equal to now moles of solute moles of solute is 0.01 divided by 60 divided by mass of solvent in kg what is mass of solvent in kg how do we do this mass of solvent in kg that is given 1 dm cube is equal to 1 kg so 0. 3000 dm cube yes now calculate this how much will you be getting how much will you be getting guys calculate this and find out yeah calculate this and find out i think you can do it very simple very easy you just have to find this answer but i guess it should be around option b yeah it should be around option b however i leave it up to you you can calculate and let us know in the comment section okay Shall we? moving on from here let's do another question here just so that we are absolutely uh, done with our you know practice here so let's do it a 6.50 molal solution of koh has a density of 1.89 gram per centimeter cube the molarity of the solution is uh, molarity of the solution is oh achha, there should be a gap here is this you have to find it out and round off to the nearest integer. You know what guys, we have actually done it. When we were doing the class 11 chapter mole concept and stoichiometry, we have done this question. So, let's take a look at it. How do you calculate? So, there is a clear relation with molality, right? M is equal to, you can also write it as 1000 times capital M divided by 1000 times of density. Yes, minus M multiplied with M of solute that will come up to that will come up to what do you have molality is given to you right a 6.50 so 6.50 is equal to 1000 m let's write it down okay 1000 m divided by 1000 d density is given to us yes 1.89 it is given to us right so 1.89 multiplied with 1000 minus what is m is m given to us 
is m given to us no so let's write again minus m but m of solute we know what is m of solute solute is what koh so koh if you calculate it will be how much o h and then plus k it will be around 16 plus 1 and then um, it will be around um, 56 56 right yes so m into 56 okay so basically now we have to do here is now we have to do here is 1890 this will become yes this will become 1890 so 1890 multiplied with 6.50 will be 6.50 into 1890 multiplied will be um 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 6.5065 1890 12 to 85 minus minus yes uh, 56 into 6.50 will be 5000 this will be equal to 364 m please check it out and let me know should it be 364 m yes 364 m let me know let me know i'm not very sure yes equal to equal to 1000 m yes is that correct that's how it should be yes so that means that that means that my capital m is equal to my capital m is equal to because this will go there so 1000 m 1000 m plus 364 will be 1364 isn't it 1364 so 12 to 8 5 divided by 1364 1364 um 1364 nine fours are four nine fours are one three six four i think okay calculate this and let me know i guess it should be again option b i guess it should be option b but calculate this and let me know yes calculate this and let me know in the comment section all right i'm leaving it up to you leaving it up to you but i guess it should be option b okay chalo now we come to a different term called solubility what is solubility guys what is solubility what do you understand by this term solubility doesn't solubility mean like you mix something is it soluble or not is it getting dissolved or not is it getting dissolved or not and that exactly is your solubility right makes sense or nonsense makes sense right isn't it so let's write it down then the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in a given amount of solvent that is called as a solubility what is solubility what is solubility the what did i say the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in a given amount of solvent the i forgot again the maximum what did i say the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved right that can be dissolved yes that can be dissolved in a given amount in a given amount of solvent isn't it in a given amount of solvent that is called as your solubility make sense yeah okay basically if you take a glass of water and in a glass of water let's just say that you can only dissolve three spoon then what is the solubility three spoons three spoons of salt or sugar whatever you want to take right okay all right makes sense okay now the next point that we have to discuss here is the maximum amount of substance that can be dissolved in 100 grams of water yes in 100 grams of water at a given temperature is called its solubility in water are you getting my point so let's write that down also what did i say i said that i said that the maximum amount of a substance yes what did I say? The maximum amount of any substance or the maximum amount of a substance of a substance that can be dissolved in that can be dissolved in Hundred gram of water. 
is called its solubility in water. It's called its solubility in water. Very simple, very easy. Yes? Do I have to explain you this? Do I have to explain you this? So basically, let's, let's say that I have taken salt. Yeah? So if I have taken salt and if I am dissolving it in 100 gram of water, then my solubility of salt in water is 3 spoons of salt because I have taken 3 spoons of salt and I dissolved it in 100 gram of water. Making sense, I have taken 100 gram of water and I have taken 3 spoons of salt. Now that 3 spoons of salt is getting dissolved in 100 gram of water. So what I have done, I have said that yes, the solubility in water for salt is 3 spoons. Got it? Yes. Now what happens is when a, when a solid solute is added to the solvent, yes, when a solid solute is added to the solvent, wait a second, I have wrapped myself around with the mic, yeah, <laughs> that keeps happening to me very often though, anyway. So when a solid solute is added to the solvent, some solute dissolved, right, yes, some of the solute it gets dissolved. And the concentration increases in the solution, right? And do you know what this process is called? This process is called as dissolution. Now, why am I telling you this? Because these are the few terms that you must know, okay? These are the few terms that you must know. So, let me, let me write that down also for you. Yes, what did I say here? What did I say? I said that when a solid solute, when a solid solute, Yes, when a solid solute is added to the solvent, is added to the solvent, then what happens? Yes, some solute dissolves, right? Added to the solvent, some solute dissolves. And increases the concentration, right? And increases the concentration What is this called as? This process is called as This is called as dissolution This is called as dissolution. Right guys? Yes, this is what we know. So these are the few terms that you must know. Okay. Now when we come to now when we come to what really is solubility, not, not really solubility, we have understood what solubility is, but there is also three more terms that are related to solubility. That is unsaturated solution, saturated solution, and supersaturated solution. To understand these terms, let me give you a, let me tell you a story. Yeah, I'm going to tell you a story. Because I think I'm a character and I can tell you stories very well. So, <laughs> let me tell you a story. Also, I really love biryani. If you don't know about me, please know this. If you are going to learn from me, you must know that I love biryani. I really love biryani. I can have biryani for breakfast, dinner, snacks, lunch, anything and everything. You can wake me up at 3 o'clock at night and you can say that, Nabomita, want to have biryani? I'll say yes. Okay. So, coming to the story now. Coming to the story now. So let's say that, okay, right now I haven't had dinner, right? And it is about uh, 9.30 at night that I'm recording the session because studio is empty, nobody is there, very silent. And I think I can focus more <laughs> like this. Too many stories at one point of time. But coming back to the biryani story. So now I am hungry for dinner, right? Yeah. And now that I have said biryani, believe me, my stomach is growling. Yeah. So what am I? I'm not satisfied. I'm hungry. I want to have biryani, right? At this point of time, if you just give me one spoon of biryani, do you think that I'll be satisfied or would I want to kill you? I want to kill you. I would like to kill you. Like, hey, I'm hungry. You get me my whole bowl of biryani. What are you giving me? Like one spoon of biryani? Who eats that, right? So at this point of time, while I am not satisfied and my hunger has not gone down, what did I say? 
while i'm not satisfied and while my hunger has not gone down i would like to call myself unsaturated yeah i would like to call myself unsaturated okay now let's say that what did i tell you i asked you to give me one full bowl of biryani right so i you 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 took some you have some kindness and you took pity on me you were like i hear you papa ma'am you're taking classes and everything so much effort i'll give you biryani so you gave me one full bowl of biryani and i had that right within 10 minutes the whole biryani bowl was over i finished it completely now what am i now do you really think that one bowl of biryani also won't finish my hunger hey yeah come on look at me <laughs> i think one bowl of biryani is enough for me right one bowl of biryani will suffice my hunger won't be there at least but i might be greedy i might be lalchi right like you know that you feel like oh i can have so much more just because it's tasty tasty food comes you eat more right that's the case with biryani so i had one bowl of biryani and i'm fine i'm not hungry anymore so what do i call myself i'm satisfied i'm fine with it i'm saturated i'm saturated you understanding but then again of course navamita is really loves biryani and i am crazy about it so i'm not going to stop at one bowl i am saying that i want another bowl of biryani yeah now that is like greediness i just want to eat because it's tasty yeah i will get it tomorrow or day after but then again my stomach is like you know what eat it it's okay now what did i do but of course i cannot eat my stomach was full at one full one bowl of biryani so what i did was i jumped a little i was like okay let's exercise let's exercise let's dance a little bit yeah let's exercise and let's get a little hungry let's just you know shift all the food nicely yeah and and let's wear a loose trouser elastic wala trouser you know so that stomach swells up and i can fit into it still <laughs> yeah so i do that and then i eat a little bit more biryani yeah but i can only finish half bowl this time not the full bowl after the half bowl i'm like <coughs> i can't eat any more so i'm super saturated you getting my point use the same analogy here in case of solution you take a glass full of water now in that you have only added half teaspoons of salt the salt is like yo man i can dissolve more salt bring it in the salt, the solution is unsaturated the solution is unsaturated where you have only added half spoon of water because water can dissolve more yes what is happening here dissolution you are increasing the concentration yes you are increasing the concentration what is happening this is a dissolution what we just wrote this is dissolution what are you doing increasing the concentration isn't it what are you doing increasing the concentration then then you added 3 to 4 spoons of salt now water is like whoa yeah i'm satisfied cool cool but you are like no bro i'm going to add some more salt so what did you do you took the test tube and you heated it a little bit now the water has you know volume has increased there is more gap so more salt got dissolved yes but after adding let's say 5 to 6 spoons of salt the water is like bro please please let me go i cannot dissolve any more please i'm so fine i'm fine i will puke what happened here here is where the super saturated solution occurred where the solution is now unstable the solution is unstable and it tries to go for crystallization if you cool it down it will start crystallizing okay if you cool it down it will start crystallizing just like me i was ab about to puke right after that one and a half bowl of biryani i was about to puke exactly what has happened here okay all right now moving on from here so solubility don't you think that it also probably depends on certain things of course it does of course it does yes so what does it depend on solubility actually depends on factors such that it also depends on the nature of solute and solvent what does it depend on it depends on nature of solute and solvent okay nature of solute and solvent but is that the only factor no bacha that's not the only factor there are more factors right effect of temperature yes now what happens is that if the dissolution process is endothermic that means when you mix something in it and and it absorbs heat 
and it absorbs heat then the solubility will increase with rise in temperature so what am i saying here is understand this part this is the line in general if in a nearly saturated solution the dissolution process is endothermic basically here first case is first case is telling you that okay if the dissolution process is endothermic if the dissolution process is endothermic is endothermic then what will happen the solubility increases with rise in temperature okay the solubility increases increases with rise in temperature all right and the second bit what is this saying the second bit is saying that if the dissolution process is exothermic then the solubility will decrease with rise in temperature what do you mean by exothermic basically when you have mixed the solute and solvent what is happening there is release of heat if there is release of heat then the solubility will, de will decrease with rise in temperature okay so let's write that down also if the dissolution process then the solubility decreases with rise in temperature understood this is the easier explanation of basically what is written so you can read this and you can understand that all right yes now what is effect of pressure pressure does not really do much okay pressure does not have any significant effect on solubility of solids in liquids doesn't doesn't not nothing much okay it is so because solids and liquids are highly incompressible right you cannot really compress the solids and liquid if you remember in states of matter in class 11th we have studied this that solids and liquids are incompressible gases are highly incompressible so basically when you even apply some pressure the change in pressure does not really affect the solubility at all but now we are coming to the major important part of the process or important part of the chapter that is solubility of a gas in a liquid okay so solubility of gases in liquid is of course greatly affected because gases are highly compressible isn't it do you remember that gases are highly compressible so the solubility of gases with increase of pressure will obviously increase you increase the pressure that means you keep applying pressure 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 what will happen the solubility of the gas will also increase okay yes now the solubility of gases in liquids decreases with rise in temperature when dissolved the gas molecules are present in liquid phase and the process of dissolution can be considered similar to condensation and heat is evolved in process what are we saying we are saying that solubility of gases in liquid decrease with rise in temperature if temperature increases then the solubility of gas in liquids okay very simple example everybody have you seen when water is boiling in a pan when water boils in a pan you see bubbles right bubbles you see what what are those bubbles the bubbles are basically gases that are escaping from there why are the gases escaping because they can escape you are increasing the temperature they are like we i don't want to stay here yes so they will they will go out they will go out also the liquid is changing into gas isn't it so everybody is trying to evaporate they want to go out so when the dissolved when dissolved the gas molecules are present in liquid phase when you have dissolved the gas they are in liquid phase they are together with the liquid yes right but now what did you do you increase the temperature so they are escaping they are escaping away from the liquid phase they are escaping out as a gas phase okay anyway the process of dissolution you can consider it similar to condensation what is happening basically just like how in condensation you know from gas to liquid they convert basically that is what is happening okay and heat is evolved so this is a 
exothermic process okay all right now when it comes to solubility we also come across something called as henry's law which is very important yeah so henry said that henry said that understand by looking at this two uh, diagrams here henry said that the solubility of a gas in a liquid at constant temperature is directly proportional to the pressure of the gas present above the surface of liquid or solution basically you have a you have a liquid here okay this is your liquid this part is your liquid correct this part is your liquid isn't it yes this is your liquid right now in this container there are also some dissolved gas molecules what do you have there are also some dissolved gas molecules right at normal pressure yeah now what is happening is now so uh, this is at normal pressure this is a piston now when you force apply the force what is happening the pressure is increasing the pressure is increasing now as you increase the pressure do you see that the number of gas molecules has increased here here the number of gas molecules were less but here the number of gas molecules have increased number of gas molecules increased do you see that everybody i can see that number of gas molecules increased do you see that yes number of gas molecules have increased that's exactly what is said it it's just you know there is how these people are they just want to make our life a little harder right they just want to make our life a little uh, how do i say tough tough so what are they doing they have written a complex statement so let's just write it down the statement is the solubility of a gas in a liquid at constant temperature is directly proportional to the pressure of the gas present above the surface of liquid that means that you apply more pressure the what will happen what will happen the solubility of the gas will increase so let's write it down here with a different color maybe let's write it with green color here the solubility yes the solubility of a gas of a gas in a liquid yes of a gas in a liquid at constant temperature yes constant temperature is directly proportional to is directly proportional to what did i say to the pressure of the gas to the pressure of the gas then what that's where we leave it no pressure of the gas present above the liquid surface okay present above the surface of the liquid of the gas present above the above the surface of the liquid okay above the surface of liquid or solution and this my dear student is your henry's law okay this is your henry's law got it here i had written that gas molecules number of gas molecules had increased so let me write that again number of gas molecules increased okay yeah so these are the things that you have to understand all right now let's just understand an alternative an alternative of what we have just written henry's law alternative statement of henry's law is basically the partial pressure of the gas in vapor phase is proportional to the mole fraction of the gas in the solution so whatever gas is present the mole fraction of the gas that is present here is 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 what did i say yes is proportional to the is proportional to the partial pressure of the gas that is present in the vapor phase this is the one that is present in vapor phase and this is where the number of 
mole fraction uh, sorry not number mole fraction of the gas and the partial pressure of the gas phase are proportional which you can write it mathematically as p is equal to k h chi okay k h is the henry's law constant because we know that basically what he is saying is that partial pressure is directly equal to mole fraction right so p is partial pressure proportional to mole fraction that is chi now if i have to remove that partial pressure what will i do i will write it as p is equal to k h x where k h is the henry's law constant and x it's not x it's chi okay yes now different gases have different k h values different gases have different henry's constant values at the same temperature and this this means that k h is a function of the nature of gas okay k h is a function of the nature of gas all right yes now why do you see application of henry's law are we are we teaching this are we learning this just as a time pass no yeah not at all so henry's law is observed in packing of soda cans yeah soda water bottles are always packed under high pressure why so that we can increase the solubility of co2 gas the moment you and the, the moment you open the seal pss, it comes out you see that yes in deep sea diving nitrogen is more soluble than uh, helium in our blood right in the deep sea the pressure is higher than at the surface of water the pressure is much 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 higher when you go down isn't it so when the dry, when the diver they they try to come rapidly towards the surface of the water what happens the pressure decreases and the dissolved nitrogen from nitrogen it it comes back from the blood and then what it does it makes bubbles in the veins it makes bubbles in the veins and that is why divers they use oxygen diluted with helium okay that is why they use oxygen that is diluted with helium all right now let's take a look at the question chalo all right so let's read the question the question is the molarity of a solution obtained by mixing 750 ml of 0.5 molar hcl with 250 ml of 2 molar hcl will be okay so this is going to be very easy yeah this is going to be absolutely very 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 easy so let's check it out how do we solve this yeah now first things first what is going to be our formula our formula is definitely going to be capital m is equal to as we have just studied can i write it as m1 v1 plus m2 v2 divided by v1 plus v2 yeah can i write that and then you almost have all everything that is required to you yes so let's let's do what is m1 m1 is given to you as 0.5 0.5 now what is uh, v2 v1 v1 is uh, 0.5 multiplied with 750 am i right yes everybody great then plus what is second that is 2 molar so 2 multiplied with 250 and then divided by 750 plus 250 makes sense yeah that's that's what is it is going to be yes now calculate this what is the answer that you will get what is the answer that you will get come on calculate and tell me calculate and tell me guys calculate and tell me i think you can do it very easily the calculation part is absolutely easy so find the answer and let me know what it is in the comment section yes i'll be watching the session with you and i will definitely get to know if you're doing it or not okay but you have to calculate i don't have to calculate i'm done i'm done with that phase of my life <laughs> you have to calculate and let me know anyway so yeah i think the correct answer is uh, it it should be around 0.8 0.9 yeah it should be around 0.8 0.9 you calculate that and find it out anyway moving on let's let's have another question the next question is the oxygen dissolved in water exerts a partial pressure of 20 kpa in the vapor above water the molar solubility of oxygen in water is dash into 10 to the power minus 5 mole dm cube round off to the nearest integer and given henry's law constant kh is equal to 8.0 into 10 to the power 4 kpa for o2 density of water with okay all right so basically partial pressure is given to us so p is equal to 20 kpa makes sense yes p is equal to 20 kpa kilo pascal that's given to us right yes kh is also given to us so what is kh kh is equal to 8.0 into 10 to the power 4 kpa yes right everybody now what do we know we know that ph is equal to kh kai yes 
So that means that, that means how, what can I do? What can I do? All I have to do is I have to find chi. So chi is equal to P divided by KH. Is that right? Yes. So P divided by KH is equal to 20 divided by 8.0 into 10 to the power 4. Calculate this and let me know how much will you be getting. Yes, by the way, because all of them have kilo kilo. So 10 to the power 3 and then 10 to the power 3 here also it will come. Yeah. So can you calculate and find it out? I think you should be able to. I think you should be able to, but anyway, let me help you. Yeah, 4, 2, 8, and then 4, 5, 0, 20, isn't it? So, uh, then it will be, it will be 10 to the power 3, 10 to the power 3 gone. So, it will be 2, 2, 2 to the 4, and then 2.5, 2.5, yes, it will be 2.5 into 10 to the power minus 4, which means that, what will be 10 to the power minus 5? You know the answer. Find it out and put it. That's it. Okay. That's all that we have. Now, we have read till now that nature of the solvent decides the state of the solution. Right? Yes. Decides the state of the solution. That's what we have read. Right? And Henry's law, what have we studied? We have studied in Henry's law that gas in liquid. Correct? Gas in liquid. That's what we have read. Isn't it? Yes. And we have read in Henry's law that the partial pressure of the gas in vapor phase P is proportional to the mole fraction of the gas, right? What have we learned? We have learned that the partial pre pressure, sorry, the partial pressure, it seems, the partial pressure, the partial pressure, yes, of the gas, partial pressure of the gas in vapor phase, yes, in vapor phase, yes, correct everybody, is proportional to, that's what I'm just writing it down again so that you know the definition, is proportional to, is proportional to what? Proportional to the mole fraction, proportional to the mole fraction, mole fraction of, mole fraction of, the gas in solution, okay, of the gas in solution, correct, yes, I hope that you all remember this, correct, this is what we have read. Now, we are going to start with something else and this time we are going to study about, we are going to study about solutions of liquids and solids in liquid. We are done with gas in liquids, this was this particular law was for gas in liquids, isn't it? This particular was for gas in liquids. Henry's law was completely for gas in liquids. But now we have to study solid in liquids and liquids in liquids. Okay. All right, everybody. Yes. Now we are going to, um, we are going to discuss that. And that's when we are entering the waters, which are very, very, very important for us. Yes. So we are going to discuss now Raoult's law. We are going to discuss about the colligative properties. We are going to discuss about the abnormal masses. So please stick till the end of the session and you have to understand all of this. This is where we are going to rev up the engine and we are going to understand the concepts or the questions that we are going to get in JEE. Yes. Okay. All right. Now these solutions that we are going to talk about, right? We are going to talk about what? Solids in liquids and liquids in liquids. So, don't you think that there is a possibility that uh, such solutions may contain one or more volatile compounds? Yes, what did I say? I said that we are going to talk about, we are going to talk about, yes, solids in liquids. We are going to talk about solids in liquids and liquids in liquids. So, there is a possibility, there is a possibility that these are volatile compounds, yes, that there is a possibility that these may contain, may contain volatile compounds, yes, may contain volatile compounds. What do you mean by volatile? One second. May contain volatile compounds. But the question that I'm asking you is very basic. What do you mean by volatile? What is volatile? 
Volatile means something that can evaporate very fast. Okay, what does volatile mean? Volatile means evaporates quickly. Okay, evaporates quickly. Have you ever observed a nail polish remover? Yes, if you keep it on the palm of your hand, what happens? Very quickly it evaporates. Okay, very quickly it evaporates. So that is a volatile liquid. All right. Yes, so now we are going to come to come across a term called as vapor pressure. Now what is vapor pressure? Why are we talking about it? Okay, so vapor pressure is, let's understand this, okay, let's take a container here, okay, let's take a container here my dear students. Yes, in this container, let's say that I have some amount of liquid, okay, I have some amount of liquid. Now for obvious reason, if I have a liquid, this liquid is also going to vaporize, yes. This liquid will also vaporize here. Yes. These are the dots that I have made. They are the vapors, let's say. Yes. The liquid is vaporizing. The liquid is vaporizing. So, these are the vapors that you have, right? And this vapor, this vapor that the liquid has, the liquid has converted itself to vapor. So, the vapors are going to exert some amount of pressure on the liquid does that make sense everybody yes what am i saying is there is a liquid in a container forget about open container closed container don't come to that okay just understand there is a liquid there is a container there is a container in that there is a liquid and the liquid is getting converted to what vapors right so the vapors are going to exert some pressure on the top of the liquid right just like how i am standing right here the atmosphere that is above me is exerting some pressure right right everybody that is atmospheric pressure so here the vapors are putting exerting some pressure on the liquid and that my dear student is called as your vapor pressure easy peasy biryani taste yeah now read the definition at equilibrium conditions the pressure exerted by the vapors of the liquid there is any liquid whatsoever liquid you have whatever this liquid is exert whatever the vapors of the liquid is exerting that is called as your vapor pressure understood yes now for this there is a condition yes for this there is a condition what is the condition the condition is that rate of evaporation yes rate of evaporation why rate of evaporation how fast is the evaporation happening how slow is the evaporation happening that is called as rate of evaporation so the rate of evaporation is supposed to be equal to rate of condensation clear hai Yes, the rate of evaporation is equal to rate of condensation. That's a, that's a condition that is there, okay? That's a condition that is there. Now, you are going to ask me, ma'am, what affects this evaporation? I mean, come on, very, very, from a very, very, very young uh, grade, we know that what are the things that, that affect the evaporation? Change in temperature changes the, changes the rate of evaporation, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It does, right? So, if temperature increases, vapor pressure will also increase. Yes, if temperature increases, evaporation, rate of evaporation changes. That means, vapor pressure will also increase. Yes, so let's write that down, everybody. Let's write that down here, okay? Factors affecting, factors affecting vapor pressure. factors affecting vapor pressure number one is change in temperature okay change in temperature change in temperature changes vapor pressure actually it increases if this increases okay number two Second point is, second point is what? Intermolecular forces. Okay. If there is any liquid where the molecules are very strongly attracted to each other, do you think that they will be easily able to make vapor? Obviously not. This liquid, it will be like a crab. It will be like, no, 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 no. You cannot get vaporized. I will not let you go. Right? Yes. So, if intermolecular forces increases, okay, intermolecular forces intermolecular forces increases then what will happen vapor pressure decreases okay vapor pressure decreases these two are 
inversely proportional my dear student okay these two are inversely proportional please do note this okay this increases this also increases this increases this decreases okay now based on this here is a here is an equation that you have definitely heard okay there is an equation called as clausius clapeyron equation let me write that down it is definitely log how how it is how it is happening check it out check it out just have a look here okay log p2 divided by p1 is equal to yes is equal to delta h of vaporization yes delta h of vaporization divided by 2.3 r r you know what is r gas constant yeah yes exactly now 1 by 1 by what will i write 1 by t1 okay 1 by t1 minus 1 by t2 okay minus 1 by t2 i don't know for what joy i have written 7 here but yeah <laughs> these mistakes do happen so 1 by t1 minus 1 by t2 okay what is this equation this equation is called as your clausius clapeyron equation all right please do make a note of it because this will be required for you to solve a lot of problems okay what is this called as clausius clausius i don't know if i am the drama or have i not slept i am not very sure i don't know why am i making mistakes clausius clapeyron equation i'm pretty sure that you must have seen it somewhere but yeah this is the equation yeah basically what we are talking about is how pressure temperature 2.3 r and delta h of vaporization all of these things are related to it okay that's your clausius clapeyron equation anyway moving from here guys moving from here okay now let's talk about oh there was the condition that was written but i had also written it chalo let's let's do one thing let me erase it from here so that you can clearly see it all right yes cool hai arre re re where is it this is our yeah so these things we are already done with right we have understood great now so we have seen the container and we have seen how the liquid uh, how the vapor of the liquid ex ex exerts exerts pressure right that's called as vapor pressure great now how about let's take a closed container here let's take a closed container here okay this is closed i'm closing this okay this is closed let's take a closed container here now in this closed container let's say that you have a liquid okay in this closed container let's say that you have a liquid all right yes okay all right now we are going to talk about raoult's law as it is written as you can see right yes now raoult's law have two cases understand we have a closed container we have a liquid here raoult's law has two cases one one is where both the liquids are volatile both the components you have a binary solution and both the components are volatile that means liquid in liquid okay liquid in liquid okay all right liquid in liquid both are volatile okay and then you have another one which is basically your solid in liquid okay solid in liquid and that means that both are not volatile only the solvent part is volatile okay solvent is volatile cool okay guys yes so now what do we have we have a container here yes and in this container let's just say that we have two components yes there is one that is blue in color and there is also there is also the other component that is white in color that i'm drawing as you can see right yes of course now this is where i have mixed both the components this is where i have mixed both the components i have already mixed but there was also a before after right this is after mixing i also do have a before mixing so that means that i have a case where there is only my component 1 yes this is my component 
yes and i also have my component 2 let me draw that in blue yes this is my component 2 let's say this is my component 2 and this is my after mixture right now in this case i'm saying that both of them are volatile so both of them are vaporizing right the blue one is vaporizing here and the white component my component one that is also evaporating okay that is also evaporating so this one is exerting some pressure and so is the blue color one that is also exerting some pressure make sense or nonsense yes the blue one is also exerting some pressure yes well, yes everybody right right guys right is this understood okay one more time let's understand so we are now talking about raoult's law raoult's law deal with two cases okay raoult's law deals with two cases one where the liquid and liquid that means the solute is liquid solvent is liquid all right and both of them are volatile that means both of them can evaporate very quickly okay in the second case you have solid in liquid solute is solid and the solvent is liquid yes you all know what is solute and solvent i hope that solute is the let's say that solute is the sugar part and solvent is the water part right yeah easy peasy great okay now i have two separate containers one container i have component 1 or component a in the second container i have component 2 or component b i have mixed them when i have mixed them in a closed container both of this component here i have a plus b or 1 plus 2 yes these are the components of the solution components of solution making sense everybody all right guys yes making sense these are my components of solution right now raoult's law says that for a solution of volatile liquids the partial vapor pressure of each component each component what are the components component a and component b the partial vapor pressure of component a and component b of the solution is directly proportional to its mole fraction that means that that means that what does it say what does it say remember please please understand understand yes i'll tell you the definition also the definition i'll i'll show you the definition is written in the slide yes i think in the next slide it is written but understand what what raoult said okay raoult said that raoult said that for a solution of volatile liquids i told you both of them are volatile yes yes both both the components are volatile yes both components volatile we're talking about the first case my dear students both components are volatile that means they evaporate fast okay yes now the partial vapor pressure of component a is directly proportional to the mole fraction of a making sense now that's what raul said if this sentence this whole thing that he said is is you know given in a huge sentence that you read in your books and stuffs like that in your reference book but this is what he said he said that the partial vapor pressure of each component present in the solution is directly proportional to its mole fraction so if pa the pressure of a is directly proportional to mole fraction of a that means that my second component that is pb is also directly proportional to mole fraction of b makes sense or nonsense it does now do you remember that in here the component a component a was there and in here component 2 that is component b right these were your pure components yeah so the pure components before mixing they would have had some amount of pressure yeah they would have they also would have had some amount of pressure so let's call that let's call that p a not and let's call this p b not the pressure exerted by the pure components pressure exerted by the pure components so can i write it as can my this term become pa is 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 listen 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 i have to remove this proportionality okay so what can i write i can write that pa is equal to pa not multiplied with chi a can i not write that 
I can write that. Yes. And the very similarly, my dear students, my pressure, partial pressure of B will be equal to PB naught, that is the vapor pressure of pure component B multiplied with chi B. Make sense or nonsense, everybody? Understanding? Yes. Understanding? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Great. Amazing. 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 Everybody has understood this. Okay. All right. Yes. So now here, let me write down what are the terms that we have used. So we are talking about this now. Okay. We are talking about this. The first case. We haven't gone to the second case. This much is understood to everyone. This much is understood to everyone. Great. Yeah. So let me write it down here. What are we talking about? So PA. What is my PA, my dear student? What is my PA? PA is partial vapor pressure of component A. Partial vapor pressure of component A. And the same way, what is my PB? My PB is partial vapor pressure of component B. Yes. Now, what is chi A? Chi A is mole fraction. Chi A is mole fraction of A. And the very similarly, chi B is a mole fraction of mole fraction of B. Make sense? Mole fraction of B. Yes, correct everybody, right? Okay. And what is PA naught then? What is PA naught? PA naught we haven't written. PA naught is vapor pressure of pure solvent. Yes, vapor pressure of pure vapor pressure of pure A component and very similarly, yes, PB naught is basically the vapor pressure of pure component B. Correct? Yes, at a given temperature, obviously. Right? So, this is what Raoul said. Is Raoul's law clear to you all? Is Raoul's law clear to you? Great. Amazing. So that's it. That's it. That, that's it was Raoul's law. For liquid and liquid, that is your Raoul's law. Easy peasy? Great. You don't have to be scared now. Okay? And that's exactly what is written here. This is basically the sentence part. What I showed you was the derivation. This is the sentence part. Great. Now, from Raoul's law, do you know what happened? From Raoul's law, Dalton came up and he said that, guys, I'm going to give you one more sentence to read. Right? Dalton said that. And Dalton said that, the partial vapor pressures of A and B is going to be the total vapor pressure. Mind is equal to blown. Mind is equal to blown. You are still thinking that why did Dalton say this obvious fact? Oh, because at that time there were no laws, right? He had to make a law. So, he made a law. And the law he said was that total pressure over the solution, let's take it as P total. Yes, what is going to be the P total? Acha, tell me something. From here you can clearly see, right? You can clearly see, you can clearly see that partial pressure is equal to PA naught chi A. Partial pressure of B is PB naught chi B. So, what is going to be my P total? P total is basically PT. Yes, P total. P, PT is let's say that total vapor pressure or total pressure. Yes, PT is let's say that total pressure. And what is going to be my total pressure? So, my PT is definitely going to be PA plus PB. Make sense? Yes. And what is my PA and what is my PB? My PA is equal to PA naught chi A and my PB is equal to PB naught chi B. Am I right? I am right. Yes. I also know that, I also know that from a very, very, very old, uh, you know, from your class 11, you know that chi A plus chi B is equal to 1 mole fraction. Yeah, chi A plus chi B is equal to 1. So, that means that, that means that, check it out, check it out, yes. Can I, can I write that as, uh, let's say that P A naught chi A plus P B naught and then I can write it as 1 minus chi B or 1 minus chi A, 1 minus chi A, can I write it like that? Let's derive it everybody, it's going to be easy peasy, you will see, you will see, you will see. 1 minus chi A, can I write it like that? Yeah, <laughs> easy, yeah, okay, because of from here, 
from here i can write it like this correct now what will i get is what will i get check it out yes i will get it like p a not chi a plus p b not yes p b not minus p b not chi a yes so that means what i can do is now what i can do is i can i can take chi a to be common if i take chi a to be common then it will be p a not minus p b not yes plus p b not yes everybody yes now if i just write it in a better way if i just write it in a better way i can write it as p b not plus yes chi a p a not minus p b not and if you look at this carefully does it look like y plus m mx does it look like that y plus mx does this equation look like this and then if you are going to draw the uh, draw the graph you know what you will see you will see that it is a what it is a straight line that's what you are going to see yes and we will draw the graph my dear student we will draw the graph wait a second we, wait a second yes wait a second shall we draw the graph here shall we draw the graph here let's let's do that chalo let's do that then okay let's do that here here and here okay aha let's draw it again guys let's draw it again okay ha sorry very sorry these are all the mistakes that keep happening okay i am not able to draw a straight line <laughs> okay let's say that here chi a is equal to 1 okay now chi a plus chi b is equal to 1 right so if chi a is equal to 1 that means my chi b is equal to 0 makes sense yeah and if i write here my chi b is equal to 1 that means my chi a is definitely equal to 0 right yes correct okay now because i have written chi a is equal to 1 that means that my pressure that means that my pressure here will be p a not yes and because your chi b is written so i am going to make p b not here yes now have you clear just just carefully watch it my dear student do you see that my p b not is just a little below p a not yes when i i have drawn the points here i have jotted the points here and do you see that my p b not is just a little below p a not why because i am assuming that what am i assuming i am assuming that my component b component b is less volatile component b is less volatile okay that's what i'm assuming less volatile okay all right everybody okay now what will happen so slowly and steadily as we go from here to here what will happen the pressure will decrease right yes now from here to here what will happen the pressure of b will decrease yes and then what will happen from pa to pb from pa to pb this will decrease also yes and that is the graph what are you seeing all straight lines all straight lines why do you see all straight lines because like i said y is equal to mx yes y plus mx yes it did look like y plus mx so that my dear student is your graph got it yes got it okay now let's take a look at now let's take a look at the case 2 yes let's take a look at the case 2 what is our case 2 solid in liquid solid in liquid okay that means that my solute is non volatile right this is non volatile okay all right now if this is non volatile tell me something will it exert any vapor will it even get converted to vapor and will it exert any pressure not at all so what is my p total going to be my p total this time is going to be my dear students take a look at it yes p total if i have to write i usually write it as pa plus p 
पी बी बट इफ आई टेक माई पी बी इज सॉलिड यस माई पी बी इज सॉलिड सो पी बी द प्रेशर बिकॉज ऑफ कॉम्पोनेंट बी इज गोइंग टू बी जीरो सो दैट मीन्स दैट माई पी टोटल इज गोइंग टू बी पी ए विच मीन्स दैट आई कैन ऑल्सो राइट इट एज पी ए नॉट काई ए बिकॉज दैट्स वॉट इज पी ए इक्वल टू या राइट ग्रेट सो माई पी टोटल इज इक्वल टू पी ए पी ए नॉट काई ए या पी ए नॉट काई ए मेक सेंस मेक सेंस एवरीबॉडी एम आई मेकिंग सेंस ऑन नॉट ये आई एम आई एम राइट चल मी गाइज आई एम इज इंट इट ओके ऑल राइट ऑल राइट दैन ओके ओके now what is happening here is that my p total is equal to pa and i am i have written that pa not is pa not chi a right is there anything else that we can do here anything else that we can do here what do you think what do you think i can also write it as don't don't you think that i can also write it as pa not yes i can also write it as 1 minus chi b because chi a plus chi b is equal to z is equal to 1 yeah i can write it like that yes yes now if i can write it like that if i can write this like this now what will happen now what will happen any idea think about it okay let's let's do this here again so that means that i can write it as pa not minus yes pa not minus pa not chi b i can write it like this and because i know that my p total is equal to pa can i not write here pa again <laughs> i can right i can isn't it because from here from here from this equation i can write this p instead of writing p total i can write it as pa am i right just take a look at it everybody just take a look at it and see if you are understanding everything yes yes everybody yes now if this is the case if this is the case tell me something here okay tell me something don't you think that i can write it as p a not chi b okay is equal to is equal to p a not yes plus it will be or minus what do we have to write will it be minus i think minus minus will get cancelled no both the sides minus minus will get cancelled no minus will come here this side yes so minus p a right yeah i can write it like this that means that my chi b is equal to p a not minus p a divided by p a not can i write it like this can i write it like this and this is one useful formula that you will be requiring okay this is one useful formula that you will require if you want to solve problems uh, is this understood everybody yes is this understood great now let's understand the composition of vapor pressure okay very simple very easy so this time what are we doing is we are combining the dalton's law as well as the raoul's law okay so let's take a look at it let y a is equal to mole fraction of a in vapor phase above the solution okay what are we saying we are saying that let y a instead of uh, instead of taking it as chi a we are taking it as y a mole fraction of a in vapor phase above the solution and let y b is equal to mole fraction of b in vapor phase above the solution yes yes so that means that my partial pressure of component a will be y a multiplied with p total y because p total is equal to p a from dalton's law yes right everybody great and from raoul's law i know that p a is equal to chi a p a not yes so can i equate both of these can i equate both of these i can i can isn't it yes okay tell me something let's 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 do this together if you're not able to understand this let's do it here okay let's do it here i think you will be able to understand then here basically what are we saying understand okay we are saying that ya is equal to what 
y a is equal to mole fraction mole fraction of a yes in vapor phase okay yes and we are saying that y b is mole fraction mole fraction of b in vapor phase okay now from dalton's law we know that from dalton's law we know that p a partial pressure of partial pressure exerted by component a is equal to y a yes multiplied with p total this is from dalton's law this is from dalton's law yes yes everybody and i am saying that my partial pressure of a component will be chi a multiplied with p a not this is from raoul's law yes this is from raoul's so p a p a i can equate them i can i equate them or not you tell me yes we can right so that means i can write it as y a p total is equal to chi a p a not can i do that that's exactly what they have done yes similarly i can do it for component b also for component b it is going to be y of b p total is equal to chi of b p b not make sense make sense i can do this yes but i also know that i also know that chi a plus chi b is equal to 1 i do know that i do know that yeah so if i if i know this then if i know that chi a plus chi b is equal to 1 then what can i do don't you think that i can write it as i can write it as 1 is equal to check it out 1 is equal to yes 1 is equal to y a p total yes divided by p a not yes divided by p a not yes plus plus i'm writing a plus here check it out now y b p total because chi a and chi b i have removed okay divided by p b not does that make sense to you does that make sense to you now that means here at the denominator you have p a p b not that means now i'm writing it here check it out so that means that i can write it as 1 by p total i can take this common take this common chalo let me show you the longer version so that you understand longer version everybody check it out i have written 1 is equal to y a yes by p a not plus yes y b divided by p b not yes and then from here i can take p total common so that means my next step will be y by 1 by p total is equal to y a by p a not plus y b divided by p b not yes and that is exactly what is written here okay and this my dear student is the composition of vapor phase okay what is this this is your component of vapor phase got it clear now shall we solve a question how about let's solve a question chalo let's solve a question so the vapor pressure of a pure liquid a is 70 torr at 27 degree celsius it forms an ideal solution with another liquid b the mole fraction of b is 0.2 and the total vapor pressure of the solution is 84 torr at 27 degree celsius the vapor pressure of pure liquid b at 27 degree celsius okay so Uh, p a is given to us p a is equal to sorry actually um, i'm so sorry let me drink some water yeah i'm just going to drink a little water yes everybody you can also drink some water
All right. Yeah. Okay. So the vapor pressure of a pure liquid. Pure liquid. So P A naught is given to you. Yeah. P A naught is given to you. Vapor pressure of pure liquid A is seventy. Okay. Yes. At twenty-seven degrees Celsius, it forms an ideal solution with another liquid B. The mole fraction of B is okay. So chi B is given to you. Chi B is point two. Yes. And total vapor pressure. So P total is given to you. P total is equal to eighty four torr. Okay. Now you have to find P B naught. You have to find P B naught. Okay. Very simple. Very easy. So let's do it, everybody. Yes. P A chi A is equal to what? P A multiplied with chi A. If it is point two, if it is point two, what is chi A going to be? This is point two. So, chi A will be equal to one minus point two. That means it is going to be point eight. Yes. So P A chi A that is seventy multiplied with point eight, which is equal to seventy multiplied with point eight will be um, by ten fifty six. Yes, fifty six. Okay. Then now we do not know what is P B and P B multiplied with chi B. Let's say that P B is equal to A. Okay, so that means that point two multiplied with A. Okay, let's assume that P B is equal to A. So A multiplied with point two, A point two or point two A you can write. Yes. Now according to the equation, P T is equal to what? P A not chi B plus P B not chi B, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, that's the case. So that means that what is P A not chi A? P A not chi A is already given to us. That is fifty six P total is eighty four. Yes, plus point two A. So eighty four minus fifty six. Eighty four minus fifty six is twenty eight. Is equal to point two A. That means that. Twenty-eight divided by point two is equal to a. So twenty-eight divided by two by ten. So two two ones are two, two fours are eight. Multiplied with ten, a is equal to one forty tor. That is the answer. That should be your answer. That means that option C is correct answer. Yes, option C is your correct answer. Check it out. You also do it along with me. Do it. Then only you will be able to clear it. And yes, we are absolutely right. The answer is one forty torrential. Okay, all right. Now moving forward, we have another topic called as ideal solution. Acha, what is ideal solution? Before that, let's understand what is ideal scenario. Right? We keep talking about ideal scenario. Ideally this, ideally that, ideal student, ideal teacher. Right? Who is an ideal student? An ideal student is someone who does the assignment at the right point of time, who 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 submits the assignment, who submits the homework at the right point of time. Someone who studies without even telling them that, but a study no, study no, study no. Someone who studies without even any reinforcement. They don't need bike or computer or cell phone, iPhone or something like that. They will themselves study. Right? That's an ideal solution, isn't it? So he in here also. Do you know who is an ideal solution? An ideal solution is someone who obeys the Raoult's law. Yes. This Raoult's law that we spoke about, somebody a solution that obeys the Raoult's law, they are called as ideal solution. Yes, yes, yes. Everybody, okay. Now, in a solution, you know that there are two components. There is a component A. There is a component B. Now, component A will have their own interaction. A and A will have own interaction, and B and B will have own interaction. Okay. Suppose there is a school. In a school, there are two components: teacher, student. Teacher, teacher interaction is there. Student, student interaction is there, right? And then in the whole school, there is a teacher-student interaction as well, right? And that's how the school runs, correct? That's how the school runs because there is a teacher and a student interaction hand in hand. They go, and that's how the school is running very smoothly, correct? Everybody, yes, yes. In case if it is an ideal school. Then the amount of teacher-teacher interaction plus the amount of student-student interaction should be equal to the teacher-student interaction. Are you getting my point? Yes, that will be an ideal school. But that doesn't happen, no. Does that happen? That doesn't happen. Yeah. 
Now we are going to use the same example and we will understand that what are the non-ideal solutions that we are going to talk about. So just take a look at the properties here. Yes, for an ideal solution, we know that Raoult's law is, is obeyed. Delta H mix is equal to zero. That means that when you mix these two, just like I said, when you mix the teacher and the student, yes, there should not be any enthalpy change. No heat should be absorbed. No heat should be released. Okay. They should be just like how a teacher teacher stays. Like, you know, okay, let's say. So, I studied from a Kendriya Vidyalaya, right? And Kendriya Vidyalayas usually have KVs, right? KVs have a huge campus. And, uh, you know, behind the school playground, uh, the, the teacher's quarter used to be there. So, let's imagine that all the teachers, they are living in harmony. They send each other food like, ah, sir. Uh, no, let's just say that, okay. Let's say that Pratik sir, uh, uh, me, we all stay with our family in the campus, right? We have a quarter, right? So, let's just say that uh, I made uh, I made palak paneer or, or dal pappu. I made pappu, dal pappu I made. And I said that Pratik sir, how about uh, today you make rice? You give me the rice, I'll give you the dal pappu or palak paneer, right? Whatever, I gave it to him. So, that's a perfect harmony. Now, what if the students, they also stay in a campus, let's say hostel, and the students are also sharing the food. And then when we meet together, we are doing the same thing. If I have made palak paneer, I'm sharing it with my students and the students have made rice, they're sharing it with me. So, there is no change, right? There is no difference. Everything is e equal to how it was. So, just like that, here in the case of solution, when you are mixing the A and B, there should not be any enthalpy change when the components of ideal solution are mixed. There will not be any change whatsoever. And when I'm saying no change, I'm also saying that delta V mixes is equal to zero. That means that there is no volume change also. There is no volume change also. Like 50 plus 50 is equal to 100. So, it's, it, it has to remain like that. Okay. And there are examples. There are examples. It's not like ideal solution only stays in the book. But there are examples. N-hexane and N-heptane. They are examples of ideal solution. Ethyl bromide and ethyl iodide. Example of ideal solution. Benzene and toluene. Example of ideal solution. Now, let's come to non-ideal solution. In non-ideal solution, you have two cases. One, where there is a positive deviation. Where they, uh, of course, in both the cases, they do not obey Raoult's law. But one in which what happens is in which there is a positive deviation and one in which there is a negative deviation. Okay. Yes. In both the cases, they do not agree. They do not obey Raoult's law over the entire range. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere they are, you know, they are going to accept the Raoult's law. Okay. All right. So, these are called as non-ideal solution. Okay. This is called as non-ideal solution. So, in case of non-ideal solution, obviously your P total will be not equal to P A naught chi A plus P B naught chi B. Delta H mix is not equal to zero. That means there will be a definitely an enthalpy change. Delta V mix, there will be a volume change as well, right? All of this will happen. Now, like I said that there are two cases. This is case number one where you are going to see a positive deviation. So, now here what happens is the teacher-teacher interaction and the student-student interaction, yes, separate interactions that they both have is greater than student-teacher interaction. Now, this means that what will happen? The school will not run properly, right? The school will not run properly because the teacher-teacher interaction, teachers are more friendly with each other. Students are more friendly with each other. Together when you put them, they are not very comfortable. They are like, mm, I don't want to stay here. No, I want to be with some other teacher. I want to be with some other student. Yeah? Yes? So, what do you think is happening here? What do you think is happening? They will move apart. Yes? They will move away from each other. So, that means the volume will increase because everybody will try to take different, different corners. Right? Yes? Everybody will try to move away. If you make one teacher stand with another student, they will be like, mm, maintain distance, maintain distance. They will move away from each other. Imagine the same thing in a solution. Yes, imagine the same thing in a solution. You have a component A where the, 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 the forces between A and A is more. There is a component B. The forces between B and B is more. You put them together, they are like, ew. 
COVID, six feet distance they want. Yes, they want to move away. Now, when they are moving away, volume will obviously increase. Yes, volume will obviously increase. The interaction between these two is more. Yeah, interaction between these two, these two is more. Okay, so what is happening here? What is happening here? Your P total will be greater than. Yes, your P total will be. Yes, your P total will be greater than your P A naught ka A plus P B naught ka A. Now, do you remember the graph that we made? Do you remember the graph that we made? Remember what graph did we make? We made the graph something like this. Yes, our graph was something like this where chi A was equal to 1 here. So, that means that chi B is equal to 0 here. And here chi B is equal to 1. So, chi A was equal to 0 here. So, I made your P A not here and P B not here. Yes, and then we drew a line like this. We drew a line like this and we drew a line like this. Okay. Same. Exactly same. Now, what will happen? The interaction between P A is more, right? Yes, the interaction between P A is more. So, let's draw it with a blue line here. So, all you have to do is make it like this. It's a little more. For P B, once again, what are we doing? We are going to make it like this. And then this will also go like this. So, this is your positive deviation. Everything is above the curve. Okay, everything is above the curve curve that's your positive deviation the blue line is for the positive deviation okay all right so what are the properties what do you see you see that delta h mix is greater than zero less heat is evolved when the new interactions are set up why they're not reacting they're like hey go away just go away we don't want to fight we don't want to do anything just go away but volume is also increasing because they're pushing away each other right yes yes volume increases because there is less interaction isn't it Delta S mix, yes, the mixing of solute and solvent, yes, that will be greater than zero. Increased number of particles, so entropy change will be positive, yes. And delta G mix is lesser than zero because mixing of solute and solvent is a spontaneous process. So, Gibbs free energy will ne be negative. It's a spontaneous process. You are not going to ask them that, hey, mix, 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 please mix. It's a spontaneous process. It should just happen. By itself, it should, it, it should just happen without a further or external help it's supposed to happen right yes so that's why th these two are going to be similar okay these two are going to be similar for every case now examples let's take a look at some examples so you have chloroform and water ethanol and ccl4 methylon methanol and chloroform benzene and methanol acetic acid and toluene acetone and ethanol methanol and h2o c2h5 plus cyclohexane these are some of the examples that are also there in your ncrt book okay now, let's go to negative deviation, my dear student, okay. So, in case of negative deviation, now what is happening? Teacher and teacher are not very friendly. Student and student are not very friendly. You put them together. Now, they are like, oh my God, you are my favorite teacher. I love you so much. I really want to be with you only, ma'am. Please, I want to go home with you. That's the interaction when the student and teacher are put together in the room. Yes. So, basically, the AA interaction and the BB interaction was not so much. But you put them together, the AB interaction is much more. Now, this time, the molecules are not breaking away. This time, the molecules are rather coming closer. So, that means what will happen? The P total is going to be lesser than PA naught chi A plus PB naught chi B. So, what is going to be our graph this time? Let's draw it again. We will again draw it from the ideal scenario, okay. So, in the ideal scenario, what did we have? We had, uh, sorry, check it out, check it out. We had, yes, chi A is equal to 1, is equal to 1. So, that means that my chi B is equal to 0. But if my chi A is equal to 0 here, that means my chi B is equal to 1 here. So, I am going to draw here P A naught and I am going to draw my P B naught here. So, what did I do? I draw a line here. I draw a line here and I draw a line here. Okay. Now, with blue, what will happen? This time the interaction is less. So, this is how it is happening. This is how it is happening and negative deviation. P total. Yeah. So, this is your graph for negative deviation easy peasy yes so let's ch check it out what is happening here here what is happening is delta h mix is less than zero 
more heat is evolved because now new interactions okay so you put your favorite teacher in your class what happens everybody all the students are like yay super excited ma'am is your ma'am is your sir is your sir is your right yeah what if i bring uh, kr abhishek sir here or what if i bring shimon sir suddenly to this channel and i say that he is going to be teaching you mathematics what will happen all of you are going to be very excited see new interactions are formed you are excited about him what will happen a lot of chaos you are going to spam the chat you are saying oh, shimon sir is coming oh, shimon sir is coming oh, shimon sir is coming see new new attractions are set up more heat is evolved yes and what will happen now this time the volume will decrease the volume is decreasing why because interactions are less interaction are, interactions are more so what will happen spam is less spam will be less no when you come to shimon sir's class you are all like listening yeah yes sir what are you teaching very nice sir loving it you do that yeah so volume will be less and here like i said remember delta s mix and delta g mix similar exactly let's take a look at the examples here the examples are chloroform and methyl acetate h2o and hcl h2o and hno3 acetic acid and pyridin phenol and aniline acetate and acetone and chloroform acetone and chloroform please do take a look at the examples yes you must know it i don't think they will ask you in the exam but it's just good to know you must know it okay yes now we come to another topic called azeotrope what is azeotrope the the name of the thing only is not very suiting but guess what it's very easy actually very easy azeotropes are basically constant boiling mixture so another name for azeotropes is a constant boiling mixture okay yes another name for azeotrope is constant boiling mixture and which have some composition in liquid phase as well as in vapor phase all right yes they have the same composition whatever composition they had in liquid phase that's the same composition they have in vapor phase and then they are further divided into two what are the two categories there is minimum boiling azeotrope and there is maximum boiling azeotrope in case of minimum boiling azeotrope what happens is these are non ideal solution they don't follow uh, per raoul's law okay they do not follow raoul's law here what happens is here what happens is this is minimum boiling azeotrope right they deviate from raoul's law positive deviation but with a way beyond you know very 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 high positive deviation so basically what happens is in in this case yes they boil at a lower temperature than boiling point they are supposed to boil at 100 degree let's say but what are what are they doing now they boil at 80 degree celsius they're like mm, we'll just boil why why because remember what did i say At the very beginning intermolecular forces are inversely proportional to vapor pressure intermolecular forces increases vapor pressure decreases here what is happening the molecular forces are very less so they will very soon want to boil right snap 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 they will boil yes so minimum boiling azeotropes that means yes positive deviation they will have positive deviation yes and this is maximum boiling azeotrope will have negative deviation okay they do not want to yes they are what are they doing they were supposed to boil at let's say 90 degree celsius but they are like no and we don't want to leave them. so what will they do they will boil at even more temperature yes all right yes okay got it got it got it understood understood okay so that's it basically that's your minimum boiling azeotrope ma maximum boiling azeotrope and they also have graph very similar just like how we made all that graph very similar to that you have to make this graph okay very similar to that you have to make this graph by the way i think i have not written something here yeah guys this is your mole fraction this side is your mole fraction and this side is obviously pressure vapor pressure same like that you can write it for everything i guess yes this is your mole fraction and this is your vapor pressure and same like that i think you can do it i think you can do it by yourself okay let's not waste time here yeah so this is also done yeah this is also done now we come to the last bit of this part that is colligative properties shall we check it out everyone let's do it 
Now there are four colligative properties and this is also another topic from where maximum questions do come, okay. So basically what are colligative properties? The name sounds very fancy and you must be thinking that mm, we're gonna read something very rocket sciencey. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it is absolutely simple and easy. So basically colligative properties are those that do not depend upon the nature of the solute. Yes, they don't depend. Like what are you taking? What is the solute? You're taking sugar, you're taking salt, doesn't matter. They depend on the number of solute particles. What do they depend on? Number of solute particles. That means are you taking 10 number of sugar? Are you taking 10 number of salt? Then both of them will have same same. That's not the case basically. So understand this. HCl and KCl. Okay. You break HCl, what will you get? H plus Cl minus. You break KCl, what will you get? K plus Cl minus. You take NaCl, what will you get? Na plus Cl minus. All of them will have same property. That's what I mean. Okay. All of them will have the same property. So there are four important colligative properties and they are number one, relative lowering and vapor pressure, which we like to call it as RLVP. Next one is elevation and boiling point. We call it as EBP. Okay. Not easy peasy biryani tasty, but we call it as EBP. Next one is depression in uh, freezing points, so DFP. And finally, you have osmotic pressure that is OP. Please write down Nabumita ma'am OP. Just kidding. You don't feel like you don't have to write. Just kidding, okay? All right, guys. So let's take a look at vapor pressure of a solution of, let's take a look at relative lowering in vapor pressure. What does it mean? Relative lowering in vapor pressure. It is easy. Just understand. Try to understand. You, it is easy. Okay. What we are meaning to say is vapor pressure of a solution of a non-volatile solute. That means which case are we talking about? The second case of Raoult's law. What did you put? Solid in liquid. The solid obviously of course was a non-volatile solute. I mean sugar is not going to evaporate just like that. No. If you put sugar. Right. So, a solid in liquid, a non-volatile solute in a liquid is always found to be less than the vapor pressure of pure solvent. Okay, check it out. I am taking a container here. In this container, I have pure solvent. So, my pressure is going to be Pa0, my vapor pressure is going to be Pa0 because pure solvent. I am taking another container and this time what I have done is I have mixed here solute particles. My solute particles are also here. Yes, these solute particles, do you see that they have come up? So, obviously, the vapor or the vapor pressure is going to be lesser than what you have here. Here, what is happening? There are no solute particles. So, easily the vapor pressure is, you know, vapor pressure is being exerted. But here, but here it is a little less. Here, it is a little less. So, that means what are they saying is that here, yes, the P total, the P total is going to be lesser than my PA0 is always found to be less than the vapor pressure of pure solvent. Yes, this is my vapor pressure of pure solvent and this is vapor pressure of a solution that is my P total. Yes, my P total here is going to be obviously as you not PA0 chi A plus P B not chi B, right? That's what I'm saying. But I'm saying here that this term is equal to 0 because my PB is what? My PB is a solid. I don't require it. Yeah? And I'm saying that P total, this P total here for this one is going to be lesser than the partial pressure, lesser than the vapor pressure of pure solvent understanding. Yes, understanding. All right. So, one more time, what did we say? Non-volatile solute is added to volatile solvent. A is my volatile solvent and B is a non-volatile solute. So, P total is Pa plus Pb. 
right everybody is that correct or not great okay All right, so this is understood, right? This is understood. The same thing, let's just talk about it properly, okay? Let's just talk about it properly. Uh, one second, let me just check if everything is sorted. Check, check. Yeah, everything is sorted. Okay, so till here everything is clear, right? Yes, what are we doing? We are taking the second case of Raoult's law, isn't it? Yes, everybody. Great, where we are adding? A solute to a volatile solvent. Great. Amazing. So, now let's understand what exactly is relative lowering in vapor pressure. Let's, let's derive that formula. Okay. Let's basically derive that formula. So, first of all, what are we doing? As you know, yes, what are we taking? Basically, what are we adding? A non-volatile solute is added to the volatile solvent. Correct? Yes. When non-volatile non-volatile solute is added to the solvent okay yes that's what we are doing that's the second case that we have taken right so, now basically we are taking two components that is A and that is B, right? Let's say that our A is, what is our A? A is our non-volatile, no, A let's, let's consider A to be volatile solvent, okay? Let's consider A is volatile solvent, okay? And B is what? B is our non-volatile solute. So, that means, once again everybody, you understand that uh, PB is equal to 0, right? But let me write that down. So, what is going to be my P total? Uh, a, I have a volatile solvent and B is my non-volatile solute, right? So, we have to find out P total. What is my P total? My P total is basically PA plus PB. Am I right? Am I right? Okay. But I know that my PB is equal to 0. Why? Because it's a non-volatile solute. Yeah. So, that means zero vapor pressure, no vapor pressure, plus it's a soli sol solid, right? We're saying that already. Great. Okay. So, PB is equal to zero. That means that PT is equal to, P total is equal to PA. Make sense? Make sense, everybody? Yes. And I also know that, and I also know that, what is my PA? My PA is equal to PA naught chi a what is chi a mole fraction do you remember that exactly okay all right yes amazing so that means that my pt i can write it as p a naught chi a yes now i'm saying that there are only two components so it's a binary uh, it's a binary solution there are only two components and for that matter my x chi a plus chi b is equal to one i know that so, from here, don't you think that I can write it as P A naught, yes, 1 minus chi B. I can write it like this, yes or no? I can. 
so that means that that means that one second guys all right so yeah p a not is 1 minus chi b correct yes that means that that means that i can write it as i can write it as p a not yes minus p a not chi b am i right i can write it like this yes and i know from here that p t is equal to p a yes that means that this will also be p a now from here i am going to write it here okay i am going to write it here check it out so from here i am taking it here okay so check it out here check it out everybody yeah understand so p a minus p a not chi b correct that's that's where i am that's where i'm ending it right here now don't you think don't you think that i can write it as p a not chi b is equal to p a not minus p a yes can i write it like this and that means that chi b is equal to p a not minus p a divided by p a not and this my dear student is your formula for relative lowering of vapor pressure is that understood don't you think that this is very easy peasy biryani tasting i i think so i think so this is very easy right yes same thing we are following from the dalton's law from raoul's law that's where we have derived it from isn't it yes so this is your chi b is equal to p a not minus p a divided by p a not acha now tell me this this is what mole fraction yes this is what mole fraction so chi b is equal to basically yes n b divided by n a plus n b and that's how you are going to solve the formulas that's how not not the formula sorry these are the two formulas these are very important and this is how you are going to solve the questions shall we take a look at the question what do you all say ready with me chalo let's check it out yes so here is a question tell me at room temperature a dilute solution of urea is prepared by dissolving 0.60 g of urea in 360 g of water if the vapor pressure of pure water at this temperature is 35 mmhg lowering of vapor pressure will be they are asking rlvp they are asking rlvp so we know what is the formula the formula is chi b is equal to p a not minus p a divided by p a not which is also equal to n b divided by n a plus n b right right everybody yes we know that now what are the things that are given to you what are the things that are given to you p a not is given to you don't you think p a not is equal to 35 mm hg see it is written here it is written of pure water so p a not is 35 mm hg that is given to you yes right everybody now what is n of urea n of urea molar mass is given to you and you are also given a given mass given mass is 0.60 so n of urea is 0.60 divided by 60 that is equal to 0.01 make sense everybody solve it you will see great so now let's find n of water h2o that is also given see given mass is 360 g so 360 what is the molar mass of water 18 yes now 18 uh, and 360 if you simplify it it will be 20 correct okay great now now let's solve it okay so pa not minus pa divided by pa not is 35 is equal to nb we have got it nb is 0.01 divided by 20 plus 0.01 solve it everybody what will you get you will get that pa not minus pa Yes, is equal to thirty-five into zero point zero one. Multiply it, everybody. Check it out. What will you get? Thirty-five multiplied with zero point zero one. Yes, divided by twenty point zero one. Yes, I think this is going to be equal to uh, somewhere around option C. Yeah, it will be that is thirty-five point zero one. It will be no zero point. 035 divided by 20.01 i think it will be around 0.017 and that means that my this pa not minus pa can i call it as delta p this is a difference isn't it this is a difference right so can i call it delta p i can so delta p is equal to 0.017 that means that my option c is the 
correct answer. Solve it and check it out, guys. Solve it and check it out. Solve it and check it out. I think you'll find it to be true. Am I right? Okay. Great. So you have solved it. Yes. All right. Oh, this is where I was supposed to do the solution, but I've already done it. No worries. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on towards boiling point. What is boiling point? I know. I know. Some of you are like, Mom, are you think we are stupid or what? We are in class 12. We all know what is boiling point. I know that too. <laughs> but yeah, what is the difference? What is the difference between boiling point and evaporation? Anybody? Li write it to me in the chat box. I want to know. Yeah. Don't forget your ba basics. Anyway. So what is the definition of boiling point? The definition of boiling point definitely is temperature at which vapor pressure becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure. Yes. Temperature. Temperature. At which. Vapor pressure. Becomes equal to. atmospheric pressure right right everybody yes okay all right so how does the graph look like the graph will look somewhat like this i am so proud of myself that i've started to draw straight lines you know i never have been able to this is all the ma magic of this boards you know <laughs> all of it is just magic of the board anyway so let's take temperature here and let's take Vapor pressure here. Now let's say that this is 273 Kelvin. All right. Yes. Let's say that this is my 273 Kelvin. And I know that slowly it will increase, right? This is how it will increase, isn't it? This is how it will increase. Let's just say that this is my one atmospheric pressure, one ATM. Yes. And at this point, what happens? This is where the water is boiling so this will become my 373 kelvin yes 300 in kelvin 373 is the boiling point right so this is my normal boiling point yes this is my normal boiling point now we are saying that if i have a solution and in that if i add some solute what will happen my boiling point will increase yes what will happen boiling point will increase and I think that makes sense because when you add something, yes, when you add something, of course, the boiling point will increase. Don't you think so? Doesn't it make sense? Yes. Does it not make sense? You tell me. What do you think? It has to increase, right? It has to increase, isn't it? So, let's find out that what is this elevation in boiling point? What do you mean by elevation? Elevation means that there is an increase in the boiling point, okay? There is an increase in the boiling point so let's check it out basically what is happening is yes also vapor pressure decreases we just saw right vapor pressure decreases yes and thus boiling point increases so let's write it down what i'm saying here is when a non-volatile solute when a When a non-volatile solute is dissolved, when a non-volatile solute is dissolved in volatile solvent, yes, dissolved in volatile solvent, what happens to the vapor pressure? Yes, the vapor pressure decreases, yes. The vapor pressure, the vapor pressure decreases, hence boiling point, boiling point increases, yes. Now this graph, it might look confusing for you, so draw it with me and I, I believe that you will be able to understand it better, okay. So what we have to do is same like this, yes, same what we have just drawn, the normal boiling point that we drew. Yes, just like that, here also you will have temperature here. Yes, and here you will have vapor pressure. Great, okay. Now what was happening was, now what was happening was, in the previous graph, yes, in this graph we saw that, see how it was increasing, right? That was our normal, that was our normal. So let's say that this is my pure solvent, okay, this is my pure solvent. And let's say that, 
this is after I added the solution. I mean, after I added the solute, this is my solution. So basically, what is happening here is somewhat like this, this is coming, yes. And you can see that, yes, this is what is happening, am I right? So, as I said, the black part is your solvent, that is your pure solvent, yes. And the red part, my dear student, this is your solution, that means you have, <coughs> you have added the solute. <coughs> you have added the solute, right? Okay. Now, if this is solvent, then can I say that this is my TB naught, this is my boiling point, uh, this is my temperature at which boiling point of pure solvent is happening, this is TB naught, yes, and this is my TB, this is the boiling point of the solution, the boiling point of the solution. So, what do I call this gap? Don't you think that this gap is the difference between these two boiling points? So, can I call it delta Tb? Can I call it delta Tb? And that's exactly what is made here, right? That's exactly what is made here. Yes. So, when you draw the graph with me, it will become easier. You look at this, you feel like it's too confusing, right? Isn't it? Yes. So, this is 1 atm. Everybody, clear head? Clear? Absolutely clear, right? Very easy, very peasy? Great. Okay. So, moving on, moving on. So, basically what we have understood is that delta Tb or Tb is, okay. So, what we have understood is that, what we have understood is that delta Tb or not delta Tb, not delta Tb. Ari, just a second. So, what we have understood from this graph is that our Tb is equal to Tb naught plus this this boiling point plus this gap is equal to this, am I right? Yes, so that is exactly what we are trying to write here. We are writing that Tb, the boiling point of the solution is Tb naught, boiling point of the pure solvent plus delta Tb, am I right? Yes, am I right? Great, so that means that delta Tb is basically equal to Tb minus Tb naught. Make sense? Make sense? Yes. And that, my dear student, is your what? That is how you find elevation in boiling point. Yes, this is how you find <coughs> I'm so sorry. I've been teaching for the last three hours now. <coughs> there is a slight bit of, you know, my voice seems a little scratchy. Anyway, anyway. So now we understand from the experiments, whatever experiments have been con uh, have been conducted, from there we have understood that actually delta Tb is directly proportional to M. Yes, delta Tb is directly proportional to M. What is M? M is the molality of the solution. M is the molality of the solution. Now, this is the proportional. Yes, this is the proportional sign. I have to remove it. How do I remove it? I say that delta Tb is equal to Kb multiplied with M. What is Kb? Kb is called as ebullioscopic. Ebi, ebu, leo, sco, pic, constant, okay. This is called as ebilioscopic constant, all right. It is also called as molal boiling point elevation constant and M is nothing but molality of the solution. Understood, guys? Yes. Then we have a formula. <laughs> what is the formula? The elevation in boiling point, how can you find Kb? So, here we have understood that delta Tb is equal to Kb multiplied with M. So, what is Kb? Kb is equal to Rtb square multiplied with M divided by 1000 multiplied with delta H vaporization. Yes, which is equal to Rtb square. Now, you can you can take out this molarity constant here or the molar mass here. You can take, take away the molar mass and you can write 1000 into... L vaporization. Now, what is this L vaporization and uh, the delta H vaporization? Let's write it down. Yes, one is your one is your molar enthalpy of vaporization. Yes, molar enthalpy of vaporization. Okay molar enthalpy of vaporization. What is it? Molar enthalpy of vaporization, my dear student, is the amount of energy 
needed to change one mole of a substance from the liquid phase to the gas phase at constant temperature and pressure. Yes, so let's write it down. Yes, let's write it down. The amount of The amount of energy needed the amount of energy needed to change to change one mole of a substance okay to change one mole of a substance from the liquid phase to the gas phase yes gas phase at constant temperature yes at constant temperature and pressure okay at constant all right understood the second one is you have studied this in your younger classes actually the second one is latent heat of vaporization right i'm just writing it down so that this is a quick recap okay what is latent heat of vaporization? You know this as well, my dear students. You definitely know this as well. What is latent heat of vaporization? Any idea? Can somebody tell me in the chat box? Yes, it is the amount of energy that can be, that must be added to a liquid substance to transform a quantity of that substance into gas. Okay. Amount of energy that must be added to a liquid substance to convert it into a gas substance. Okay. To convert it into gas substance. All right. So, let's write it down. Yes is the is the amount of energy is the amount of energy that must be added that must be added to a liquid substance to a liquid substance to to convert or to transform a quantity okay liquid substance to transform to transform what did i say to transform a quantity of that substance yes to transform a quantity of that substance into a gas okay into a gas guys don't worry about it i'll be anyway giving you the uh, pdf so uh, don't worry about it you will be able to see it hana? you will be able to uh, get the whole notes yeah i'll be sending it to you in the uh, telegram channel cool please do join the telegram channel yeah okay now moving on here is the question the molal boiling point constant for water is 0 0.513 degrees celsius kg per mole when 0.1 mole of sugar is dissolved in 200 gram of water the solution boils under a pressure of 1 atm at let's find out yes what is kb kb is given to us kb is given to us what is kb see the molar boiling point constant for water is given 0 0.513 so 0 0.513 okay 513 degree celsius write that down yeah now 0.1 mole of sugar is dissolved in 200 gram of water, isn't it? 0.1 mole of sugar is dissolved in, yes, is dissolved in 200 gram of water. Great. Yes, everybody. Okay. Now, what do we have to do? Now, what do we have to do? So, what is going to be our M? 
our capital M is going to be 0 0.1 divided by 200 in 2000. Yes, yes. So 0 0.1 divided by 200 multiplied with 1000. Yeah, makes sense or not? Into 1000. So this will be equal to 0, 0, cancel, 0, 0, cancel, 2, 2 into 5. So 0 0.1 into 5 is going to be 0 0.5. Makes sense? Yeah. Now, now what do we have to do? The question is the molal boiling point constant for water is 0 0.513 degree Celsius. Uh, 513 degree Celsius kilo, uh, kg per mole when 0 0.1 mole of sugar is dissolved in 200 gram of water. The solution boils under a pressure of 1 atm. Okay, that means that delta tb delta tb is equal to kbm yeah okay which is basically equal to 0 0.513 yes multiplied with 0.5 acha this is supposed to be small m okay small m yes 0 0.5 calculate this calculate this what will you get 0.5 0.513 uh, around 0 0.25 0 0.25 yes I think that's the that's the scene yes now what do we have to do is we have to find TB so what is going to be our TB our TB is definitely TB naught minus delta TB yes if you remember the formula right or uh, no not huh, minus only minus right Minus or plus? I forgot. TB not plus. TB is equal to TB not ha huh, plus. So that means now what is our boiling point? Our boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius, right? So what do we do? 100 plus 0.25 is equal to I think option C is the correct answer. Yes, I'm pretty sure that it is option C. Option C is the correct answer. Great. All right then, moving on. Yes, option C is the correct answer. And finally, we have come to freezing point and this is the third colligative property. Yes. So, what are we talking about here? The temperature at which vapor pressure of solid becomes equal to vapor pressure of liquid is called freezing point. Right. Let's write it down then. What is it? Temperature. at which yes temperature at which vapor pressure vapor pressure of yes of solid vapor pressure of solid yes becomes equal becomes equal to vapor pressure equal to vapor pressure of liquid is called vapor pressure of is called freezing point right yes absolutely so what is depression in freezing point so basically what is happening once again guys you are adding a non-volatile solute dissolved in a volatile solvent so what will happen vapor pressure will decrease if vapor pressure decreases then what will happen the freezing point will also decrease okay the freezing point will also decrease so let's write it down let's write it down what did i say when non-volatile solute is dissolved yes when non-volatile solute is dissolved in a volatile solvent the vapor pressure decreases hence freezing point decreases okay so let's draw the graph yeah let's draw the graph 
same like before yes we are going to draw a graph like this yes two axis you will have temperature here and you will have vapor pressure here okay yes now what will happen is for the pure liquid yes for the pure liquid obviously what will happen is it will be solid first and then it will become liquid is that right that's right yes it will be freezing right so from here to here it's frozen it's solid and then from here to here it's liquid but for the solution what is happening the for the solution this is like this yes for the solution it's like this so now what is happening is check it out everybody now what is happening check it out yes this is at 1 atm okay at 1 atm one second at 1 atm this is what is happening okay yes so at this point you have a temperature and at this point you are getting a temperature yes so this is this is tf yes this is tf all right and this is where this is where my pure solvent is pure solvent is freezing so this is my tf not what do i call this gap i call this as delta tf making sense or nonsense yes make sense or nonsense right everybody so that means that that means that that means that tf yes tf the freezing point of the solution all right let me write that down also this is your solution guys this is the curve for solution and uh, this is the curve for pure solvent right yes okay so basically what i said right now is that my tf okay tf the freezing point for the solution plus delta tf is equal to tf not make sense make sense yes and what is my delta tf delta tf is the depression in the freezing point the dip in the freezing point okay all right now obviously just like the previous one just like the previous colligative property here also you get to see that from this exp from experiments tell you what will happen is that our tf delta tf is directly proportional to obviously m right now i have to remove this how will i remove this i will have to introduce a proportionality constant isn't it yes so let's do it so basically delta tf is equal to now kf multiplied with m what is kf kf is called as cryoscopic constant okay kf is cryoscopic constant just like how you had read kb is ebullioscopic constant this is your cryoscopic constant yes and how do you measure m m also has its own specific formula that you have been studying from class 11th actually yes and what is it yes w2 multiplied with 1000 w2 is basically the weight of the solute multiplied with capital m into w1 okay yes that is your formula so what you can do is you can also write that delta tf is equal to what is kf now kf is your cryoscopic constant multiplied with m so w2 into 1000 divided by capital m multiplied with w1 right and that becomes your formula for you to solve any kind of numericals understood yes so let's quickly check out now what can you write kf to be as how can you find kf kf is your molar depression constant cryoscopic constant how can you figure that out for that you have another formula that is rtf square divided by 1000 into l fusion what is l fusion l fusion is latent heat of fusion in calories yes latent heat of fusion in either joule per gram or calorie per gram okay just like how we did that molar enthalpy of fusion latent heat of vaporization just like that can you write that definition for latent heat of fusion i think you will be able to can you do that for me yeah write that on your own so that you understand it a little better okay so this is the formula that we will be using in problems so shall we do a problem let's do a problem here okay so here is a problem everybody take a look at it what mass of sugar okay c12 h22 m is equal to 342 must be dissolved in 4 kg of h2o to yield a solution that will freeze at minus 3.72 degrees celsius 
KF is also given to you right here. So let's write our KF. KF is equal to 1.86 degree Celsius per mole. Okay. All right. KF is there. Now, we know that delta TF is equal to KF multiplied with M. Right. Yes. But apart from that, check it out. Delta TF, they, they are saying that to yield a solution that will freeze at minus 3.72. But what do we know? What do we know? H2O is given, right? <clears throat> so, what should ideally the freezing point? What should ideally the freezing point be? It should be 0, yes. So, let us write 0 minus minus 3.72 degrees Celsius, which means nothing but plus 3.72, correct? That is your delta Tf, all right? Yes. Now, I can write that delta Tf is equal to Kf multiplied with M. Am I right? Can I do that? I can do that. What is my M? I know that M is equal to 1000 multiplied with W2 divided by capital M multiplied with W1. Yeah, I can do that. Yes. So, basically, my delta Tf now will be, yes, Kf that is 1.86 multiplied with 1000. Yes. W2, do, I, do we know the W2? No. What mass of sugar? What mass of sugar needs to be dissolved? So, we do not know W2 basically, right? We do not know what is W2, yeah? So, let me write it as it is. W2 divided by what is M now? What is M? M is 342. It's written clearly. So, 342 multiplied with 4 kg. So, 4 into 10 to the power 3, okay? So, basically what you can do is if you consider this to be almost 2, then this can be divided with this 2, 2 is a 4, 2. 2 is a 4, 2 4 is a 8, 2 3 is a 6, that means 6, 8, 4, 684, yes, multiplied with, here it is, 684 multiplied with uh, 3, 3, 3 is a 8, 3 is a 24, and then 3 6 is a 18, 19, 20, I think it will be around option A, I guess it should be around option A. I have just approximated. So, calculate and let me know though. Calculate and let me know. I have just approximated. I think that if you calculate this whole part then and delta Tf as you know is your 3.72 multiply this. I have approximated and I have calculated but do let me know if that is the correct answer or not. It, it may not be, okay. I am a little confused between option A and option B because both of them are around I have just calculated in my head. So, you tell me what is the correct answer. Any which ways guys, moving on from here. Oh, option A is the correct answer. Great, amazing. We are right. <laughs> All right. So, moving on, let's take a look at osmosis, okay? Yes, what is osmosis? What is osmosis? Do you know what is osmosis? Osmosis is basically the passage of pure solvent into solution. Yes, pure solvent to solution. All right. Yes, how is the root taken? The root is pure solvent to solution. That means from less concentration to more concentration, yes, through a semi-permeable membrane. So, what I am saying is, you can read the, read the whole definition, but basically what it is saying is that from pure solvent, yes, pure solvent to traveling, somebody is traveling, yes, who is traveling? Pure solvent to solution, yes, the journey is from pure solvent to solution. Now, in case of pure solvent, obviously, there is no solute. So, can I say that it is less concentration? Yes, I can. What is solution? Solution will definitely have solute. So, may, that means that more concentration? Yes, I can. And what is this? This is through. This is happening through a semi-permeable membrane. All right. This is going to happen through a semi-permeable membrane. Am I right? Yes. And that is exactly your definition. Got it? Yes. Now, the fourth colligative property is not osmosis, osmotic pressure. What really is osmotic pressure now? Osmotic pressure, when we say osmotic pressure, we mean to say that basically, now this time you will have to, okay. So, this is the movement that is happening. This is your pure solvent. Yes, this is your pure solvent side. This is your pure solvent side, okay. And this is your solution side, okay. Right? Yes. So, from pure solvent to solution, the movement is happening from pure solvent to solution, right, as you can see. Now, what I have to do is I have to apply pressure this side. I am going to apply pressure here so much so that this movement stops. 
and that my dear student will be called as your osmotic pressure the excess pressure that you have to apply to the solution side so that the movement stops that's called as osmotic pressure and how do you write osmotic pressure you write osmotic pressure as pi is equal to crt okay now you must have heard about this formula also pv is equal to nrt and what is this this is a pressure so don't you think that i can also write it as pi v is equal to nrt i can right and this is necessary for solving problems got it now you might ask me that ma'am what is c c is nothing but the molar concentration of solution or molarity yes c is nothing but molarity and we are basically just assigning another letter to it okay all right now what if i have two or more than two solutions yes and let's say that all of them have the same osmotic pressure if that happens then what do i call them i call them isotonic solution so let's go to a problem yeah shall we do that let's go let's go let's go yeah here we go okay so here is a problem but guess what i am not going to do it i want you to do it check it out how you have to do it yes i'm going to give this to you as homework and please do let me know the answer yes in the comment section and i'll definitely let you know if you are right or wrong all right yes now the last bit of it is van t hoff factor so what happened is basically you know uh you know whenever a reaction happens in in our older days in when we were uh, you know younger when we were chotu motu bachchus yes at that time did we not learn that reactions are of different types there is decomposition reaction there is a uh, composition uh, sorry there is a um, combination reaction yes so there are reactions where basically combination is happening where many reactants are forming one product and there is also such reactions where one single reactant is breaking down into different parts right so basically decomposition reaction can also be called as what dissociation right and composition uh, sorry not composition yeah combination reaction can also be called as what association where association is happening they are coming together right everybody exactly so to understand that how much of association has happened and how much of dissociation has happened in a solution now i have just given you the types of reaction as an example we are not talking about types of reaction we are talking about solution so in a solution when you put some electrolyte either they dissociate they break down like hcl if you take hcl and mix it what will happen h plus cl minus right but there are also type there are also those those uh, you know solutes what happens is they associate yes like uh, dimerization of acetone that happens in benzene correct they associate so to understand how much of dissociation or how much of association has happened we have introduced van t hoff factor so what is van t hoff factor it is denoted by a small i and that means that normal molar mass divided by observed molar mass observed colligative property divided by normal colligative property or it can be actual number of particles divided by number of particles for no ionization all right yes now let's check it out for van t hoff factor and degree of dissociation okay so let's check it out what we are going to do is let's take a reaction and our reaction can be let's say an okay which goes and becomes n a right so now let's say that at t is equal to 0 when the reaction has just started and nothing much has happened yes there i had 1 mole of this and 0 mole of this right at t is equal to t at certain point of time what happened it was that from one a certain amount of a certain amount of particles left and this can be multiplied with the coefficient so nx so what is going to be my i check it out what is my i i is normal molar mass divided by observed molar mass that means 1 minus x plus nx divided by 1 plus 0 which is nothing but i is equal to 1 minus x plus nx divided by 1 which means that i is equal to just the numerator isn't it just the numerator and that my dear student is your van t hoff factor for degree of association that's how you calculate so what is n here n is basically the number of moles dissociation the number of moles formed product number of moles of product basically number of moles of product okay all right product form great now let's take a look at what is the degree of association here okay so what do i have to do is i have to take the same to same reaction n to the power a 
but don't you think that I can also write it as a can be 1 by n to the power 1 by n multiplied with n a I can write it like this now once again same t is equal to 0 I had one mole of this 0 mole of this at t is equal to t at certain point 1 minus x multiplied with the coefficient coefficient is 1 by n so multiplied with x that means that my i is going to be 1 minus x plus x by n divided by 1 plus 0 yes that means that my i becomes yes my i is equal to 1 plus 1 plus 1 by n minus 1 with x don't you think that this is my van Hoff factor yes yes and now here n is basically number of moles of reactant yes so this is degree of association and that was degree of dissociation and with this note we have almost come to the end of the colligative property as well as the end of the chapter guys yes if van Hoff factor is known then the various colligative properties would be given as now basically all you are doing is you just have to add the i factor everywhere all the formulas that you know now add i so delta tf is equal to i kfm delta tb is equal to i kbm pi v is equal to i nrt p naught minus p divided by p naught is equal to i n2 divided by n1 plus i n2 okay got it now i have two more questions that i want you all to do the solutions the answers are also there but please do it on your own and then check it out if it matches or it doesn't okay so these are your homeworks everybody yes and with this note, everyone, we have come to the end of the session. I hope that you have understood everything. Yes, I'm sorry that it took a lot of time. But uh, yes, there I do style. Even though better late than never, right? So we are here, everybody. The next upcoming chapter would be electrochemistry. I'll see you very soon. All the very best and ta-ra. Bye-bye. Guys, see you.